this video, we come to the conclusion of our study, our brief survey of biblical ethics. And we'll be looking at the Tenth Commandment and then some concluding thoughts. So let's think about the Tenth Commandment. The Tenth Commandment, you shall not covet your neighbor's house, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife, or his male servant, or his female servant, or his ox, or his donkey, or anything that is your neighbor's. Now this commandment, as we look at it, especially in light of the other nine commandments, it, we see that this gives us an inward focus to the whole law. You see, the Old Testament law was never limited to external actions. Sometimes we hear people say that the Old Testament focused on externals and the New Testament deals with the heart. The Old Testament was always concerned with the heart because God has always been concerned with the heart. The Tenth Commandment shows that our heart attitudes are important. What's in our heart is actually one of the Ten Commandments. So the Old Testament was never limited just to external actions. Now the Jews in Jesus' day may have seen it that way, but that wasn't what God intended. What this shows, too, is that it shows the importance of our thought life. You see, sin begins in the heart with the thoughts, with evil desires. This is what all of Scripture teaches us, that sin comes from within. It isn't something that happens to us. It isn't something that is purely an action. It takes root. Its root is in our heart, in our thought life. Uh, for example, there are stages of sin. First, there's a spontaneous desire, something that catches you off guard. You know, as you are, uh, for example, I think about, since I'm a man, I think about uh, things that affect men, and one of them is lust. And so we're walking out somewhere, and there's a woman with a very short skirt on. Okay, that catches us off guard. Okay, so there's a spontaneous something, there's spontaneously something that comes to us. But then that desire, that spontaneous thing that happens, we can nurse that desire. We can begin to think about that. That begins to roll around in our mind, and we think about that. And then, pretty soon, if at some point, we may start making a plan to achieve that desire. Uh, it involves our will. At that point, we've made a conscious decision. Okay, I'm going to do something to fulfill this lust. And then finally, you accomplish that desire. That's the deed itself. But you see, it began long before that, when that temptation came, and we began to nurse that and to roll that around and to ponder that in our mind. Now, there's a difference here or a distinction that can be made between coveting and envy. Uh, an author, Helmut Schirk, has written a book just called Envy. Uh, which was a sociological analysis of this whole concept. But the idea of coveting is that you set your desire on something so that you can't keep your hands off it. Okay, So that if I covet somebody's new car, for example, I look at it, I long for it, I wish I had it, I, it kind of consumes my mind about wanting that car. Uh, maybe even I make plans how I might steal that car or how I might dishonestly earn money to get a car like it. Uh, but that is what covetousness is. Now, according to Helmut Schuck, envy takes that a step further. It takes to the point of we wish the destruction of others. So I look and I see somebody's car that I can't have, that I don't have, I look in the parking lot and there's somebody that has a real nice new Corvette. I don't have that Corvette. I wish I did. I know I'm not going to get it. I don't earn enough money to get it. So I make plans to blow that car up so that that other person can't have it. If I can't have it, they can't have it either. That's envy. And it's had a uh, very powerful effect on cultures. Uh, Helmut Schuch writes about cultures that are based upon envy, uh, especially when you have, for example, voodoo. And so nobody in the culture wants to get ahead because if I start getting ahead, if I start earning money and gaining wealth, my neighbors are going to be covet they're going to be envious. 
they're going to call the witch doctor. They're going to do something to try to harm me. And so it's an incentive for me not to get ahead. And so whole cultures have been built upon envy and they stay in poverty because nobody wants to get ahead. Unfortunately, that's where our own culture here in the United States is going. When we see people talking about, well, to the wealthy businessman, well, you didn't build that. Or we have a popular book that has just come out, uh, an economist who has written about how uh, all wealth above $500,000 should be taxed at the 80% tax rate, not to do anything, not to meet any particular government needs, but just to take it away from them. They don't deserve that wealth. That is envy. And so that is condemned in scripture, this idea that we would take something away from others. Instead, what the Bible teaches is the emphasis on contentment. We're content with what God's providence has given us. Now, contentment doesn't just mean that we are complacent. It doesn't mean that we say, well, here's my lot in life and that's all I can do. Uh, the Bible tells us, Paul tells us, that if we can get ahead, we should do so. But we should be content where we are. If we are uh, in a job that is a low-paying job, it's fine to try to get a better-paying job. But in the meantime, be content. Don't be covetous. Don't be envious of others. Trust that God has placed you where you are. Trust that God has given you what he wants you to have. Now, as we look back on the Ten Commandments, I think it's helpful for us to see the breadth of these commandments because these are not just ten pigeonholes that we say, okay, this sin is here, this sin is here, this falls in this hole, that type of thing. In a sense, see, any sin can be seen as a violation of any commandment. Now, each commandment does have a specific focus. There's a specific focus to, for example, the first commandment, we are to have no other gods. The second commandment focuses upon our worship of that true God. So there is a specific focus to each of the commandments. That's what we've been looking at. But we can also see that each commandment is a perspective on all the others. I can view all of the commandments in light of the first commandment, having no other gods before, you, before God. Because if I look at any of the other commandments, thou shalt not steal, for example, at that point, when I steal, I am setting some other God ahead of the true God because I'm not serving the true God at that point. Uh, so that each commandment can be seen as a perspective and a violation of one commandment then is a violation of all the commandments. Again, think about it like this. If I, when I steal, I've placed another God before me, the God of my own desires. If I steal, I've obviously coveted first. I've committed adultery when I steal because I've committed spiritual adultery against God. I've been unfaithful to him. I have taken the name of the Lord in vain because, remember, to take the name in vain means to wear it improperly. And when I steal, I am not proclaiming the name of God by my life. James had, says something similar to this when he says whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become accountable for all of it. So that we can't just say, well, I've kept nine of the Ten Commandments. If you violated one, you have in essence violated all of them. Any of the commandments can be a perspective on all the others. Now there's something that has been helpful to me in understanding a biblical approach to living the Christian life. It's the concept of the triangle of necessary and sufficient conditions. Okay, that's a nice long phrase. Okay, teach that to your kindergartners next time and they can impress their parents when they go home. But what we've done is we've talked throughout this lesson, these series, about how the Bible says our motive, our heart attitudes are important. See, we have to love the Lord our God with all our heart our, and we have to love our neighbors ourselves. 1 Corinthians 13 teaches about the necessity of love. So a right motive is necessary for biblical ethics. But let's think about this a little bit differently. If you really love God completely, if you really love your neighbor as yourself, 
That's all you need to do. If you have done that, you have fulfilled all the law. But if you really love God, you're going to want to keep his commandments, the standard. John 14, 15, Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments. So if you are truly loving God, completely loving God, it will involve keeping his law. Likewise, if you are truly, completely loving God, you will want to see his kingdom advanced. You will want to see God glorified. That's the goal you will seek. So in one sense, all we need to think about to live the Christian life is our motive, our heart attitude. If our attitudes are right, really right, we will live a Christian life. But let's think about the goal or outcome. It's necessary. Okay, there's the necessary part. It's necessary that we seek first the kingdom of God. It's necessary that we glorify God. If we ignore these goals, we're sinning. If our actions are not resulting in an advance of the kingdom of God and the glory of God, we are not living the Christian life. So seeking the right goal is absolutely necessary. But if we're really seeking the right goals, we will inevitably obey God. How can we glorify God by disobeying him? Paul said, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. We don't look for the goal of grace by violating the standard. Okay, If our goal is to glorify the grace of God, we're not going to do that by sinning. Seeking the right outcomes, the right goal, will involve obeying God's law. And seeking the right outcomes will only come from a heart that loves God. The only way we can really see God's kingdom prosper is if we love him and love those in his kingdom. So a focus on biblical goals will result in having the right motives and living according to biblical standards. In one sense, all I have to think about is the goals, the outcomes of my actions. If I really do that, I'll live the faithful Christian life. Now, what about our standard, the law? Well, we've seen that following the law is essential. John said, whoever know, says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. So obedience to the law is essential and necessary for living the Christian life. But remember that one of those commandments, one of the things we're commanded to do, is to have the right motive. After all, we are commanded to love the Lord our God. A standard, a law, is to have the right motive. So if I say I'm obeying God's law, but I don't have love, I'm not keeping that commandment, and I'm not really obeying God's law. Likewise, Jesus commanded us to seek first the kingdom, and Paul commands us to do all to the glory of God. So if I say that I'm obeying God, but I'm not seeking to advance his kingdom, then I'm not really obeying God. Keeping God's law involves seeking the goals he's set out. In one sense, then, all I have to think about is keeping God's law. If I'm keeping God's law perfectly, completely, that'll take care of my motives and my attitudes. That'll take care of the outcomes and goals of my actions. So in one sense, each of these, motive, goal, and standard, is necessary for the Christian life. If I have love, but I'm not keeping the commandments or I'm not seeking his kingdom, I'm not living a faithful Christian life. If I seek the kingdom, but I don't do it from a heart of love or obedience to his laws, I'm not a faithful follower of Christ. And if I keep his commandments, but don't do it from love and don't seek his kingdom, I'm not living a faithful Christian life. So in one sense then, each of these is sufficient for the Christian life. A full and complete understanding of motive, goal, and standard will involve the other two perspectives. And that's what we really see 
instead of there being three different things, like now I'm going to think about my motive, now I think about the goal, now I think about the standard, there are really three ways of looking at the same thing, the Christian life. It's like looking at a diamond from various angles. It's one diamond, but as we turn it around, we see different views. So the Christian life can be seen as love, or the Christian life can be seen as seeking the kingdom, or the Christian life can be seen as obedience. They're all correct when we understand them properly. Now, a lot of what I've gotten for this series has come from various teachings I've had, but it's put together most clearly in this book by John Frame, The Doctrine of the Christian Life. I highly recommend this book. Uh, it's long, but it's not. Uh, Frame is a very clear writer. He's a very understandable writer. You have to think when you read him, but he is very understandable and very clear, and he explains a lot of these issues in greater depth. So if you want to go more into this idea of ethics, I highly recommend this book of John Frame. Now after this video is over, the final assignment is for you to post some thoughts in the discussion board, particularly I want you to tell how you have or could apply two of the Ten Commandments to your students. It might be for your class as a whole, it might be for an individual student or students, but just give two examples of two of the Ten Commandments. Post your thoughts there and feel free to comment on posts that others have made. I hope this series has been helpful for you. I hope it has helped you to understand a bit more about what the Christian life is like. And so I hope that our God will be glorified as we all together seek to teach students how to live the Christian life faithfully. Lord bless.